Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Hope you got some caffeine, got a chance to jump around. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing the session today. Um, our first presenter is actually doing double duty. Um, so um, let me first introduce Anna Chiaretta Lavatelli. Yep. Um, try not to Perfect. butcher her name. Um, she is the video project manager for Balboa Park Online Collaborative. Um, and she is doing two sessions, as I said, um, creating video content for Conservation Reel with consumer technology, um, followed by the message in the medium for the masses, video production in museums, ideal production and real production. Um, and she will be followed by Michael Null, who's the content producer for Second Story Interactive Studios. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try and stick to the, um, the half hour format. So um, Anna's gonna do her first presentation, leaving time for questions, and then go on to the second presentation, leaving time for questions, and then we'll go on to Michael. So without further ado, take All it right. away. Thank you. Um, so um, I want to say, um, interrupt me to ask questions. Sometimes I get into technical, I'm going to try not to, but uh, sometimes I get into the technical nitty gritty. And so if I'm getting into too much of that and something doesn't make sense, I feel, please interrupt me um, to get, uh, to figure out where I'm trying to go. So. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about, originally I uh, conceptualized this as a workshop, and so I'm going to, I kind of want to show you some things, but um, what I first need to do is sort of introduce you to the idea of using uh, consumer technology in context of this project. Um, and so Conservation Reel is a, a website project um, where we're trying to get uh, gather content uh, through uh, conservators, as opposed to um, needing a video crew to gather that content for you. Um, and so I, I have this um, idea that when the content is good, we're a lot more forgiving of production quality, right? Like when it's really good content, really interesting things, like when it's Zizek, uh, you know, sharing his um, you know incredibly dense uh, theory. We're really forgiving of this hideous staging um, that EGS is uh, notorious for. Um, I, I love their videos and I watch them because the content is really good, but they are ugly. Um, <laughs> they're really not great production quality, and but it doesn't matter because this is really and it's it's the same I think principle that we take into documenting lectures, right? We uh, we have a camera in the corner that is doing the best it can, but it's not a great lighting situation. It's not the best audio situation. Like I'm I'm probably gonna lose this mic um, and we're gonna have um, not as good production quality but hopefully the content is good enough that people will watch it anyway right that's the hope um, the other um, idea is that if we make production really simple and easy um, people can create their own good content um, YouTube uh, is really full of like eh, production quality but there's really interesting content like if you want to know how to uh, set up your iPhone to record video there are so many people who've uploaded their videos explaining how to um, use uh, an iPhone with this particular cable, with a lavalier microphone on a particular tripod, so that you can understand good production tactics for an iPhone. I don't need to make that video because all these users have already generated that content. Um, and I think that that's something museums are very aware of. Um, I was fortunate enough to see this um, project in action. I think it's a great idea, putting the laptop in the museum and letting people record their own content. Um, and Brooklyn, um, I'm suddenly spacing Shelly. Um, Bernstein. Bernstein. I was spacing on her last name. Um, you know, shares how to set these things up on her blog. And so this idea that we can all do these things and that everything is really accessible and that we can do down and dirty projects with a couple of laptops is, um, I think, really core to the movement um, uh, of video making. And so um, now I'll explain uh, Conservation Reel. So this is a Crest funded. Uh, project uh, that um, BPOC is taking on in collaboration with BACC. BPOC is Balboa Park Online Collaborative, for whom I'm the video um, content producer, and BACC is the Balboa Art Conservation Center, um, which is a regional conservation studio uh, in Balboa Park. And so we started experimenting with um, producing content together there. Um, and then through the guidance of a really wonderful advisory committee, we started conceptualizing where else we can go to start to rethink how we produce content, how conservators can incorporate content production into uh, their practices. So this is the beta website. You can see that it's built on the Art Bevel platform uh, created by uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art. And so it has a sort of similar uh, 
layout. Um, it's, it functions very much uh, the same way so that um, different partner in institutions, so contributors, can start uploading their content. What we're hoping is rather than contributors being institutions um, and museums, that, that it's um, actually the conservation labs inside an institution or a regional conservation lab that's developing their own content. Um, and so that's what um, has uh, pointed me towards proposing to show you how we can produce that kind of content. Um, and so I call it tiny, tiny production um, <laughs> because it's as simple as having an iPhone, um, uh, taking your own iPhone and using it for um, these purposes, um, getting a $24 cable. This is the key to the equation. It took me a while to figure this out. There's a company called KVM that sells these. Um, and uh, I have cards so that if you need to know where to get any of these things, I can uh, share that with you. And then a $20 lavalier mic, which you can get on Amazon. Um, and so sound is key to production. Um, and so this is always part of the equation, some kind of lavalier microphone. If you get a $20 one, you, get, you have to deal with this. <laughs> um, if you want to uh, spend on a wireless system, you'll probably be really happy uh, that you've made the investment. Um, but then this also um, using uh, really cheap handy cams on another $20 tripod system. Um, and these, I mean, these cameras are getting better and better. And the quality is, is fantastic. Um, it's also using the webcam on a laptop if you just want to explain some process that you've realized. Um, and then also conferences, AIC, um, there's the um, WAAC that happened just now in Palm Springs, um, and the idea that we can set up a screen record on the um, computer to uh, capture your voice and your slides. So if you're camera shy, you don't even need to be a part of it. You can still be sharing content um, uh, in, in a really easy, accessible way. And so starting with um, screen capture, on Max, a lot of people don't realize this, but QuickTime Player uh, has recording uh, ability built into it. Um, you can do uh, movie recording with your webcam, uh, audio recording with the built-in mic, or you can plug this little guy into your laptop and use your $20 lavalier microphone with your laptop. Um, or on a PC, there's um, Cam Studio, which is a free download. There's a few, there, for PCs, it's always easier, right? Because there's all this like open source, really easy, accessible software. Um, and there's tons and tons of instructional videos on YouTube of people explaining how to do this if you really want a step-by-step -step instruction. Um, just because I, oh, now I'm really going to, ah. So um, if I go to my QuickTime player, um, new screen recording, and then this is the key. This little arrow here is where you activate your audio recording. And so um, you can use your built-in mic on your laptop, which actually gets amazing quality, even on this four-year-old beast. Um, or you can do your line in, which is um, next to your headphone port, and you can plug in your lavalier microphone, and then you can document your entire uh, presentation, upload to YouTube, and share um, content that way. Um, so let's see, back into this guy. Um, the, let's see, that's how you do it in QuickTime. Um, so then um, moving on to Handycam and iPhone production, um, I, I, I broke down the elements of production into four really simple, straightforward things. Um, as mentioned uh, this morning in the conversation with Curtis and Rob Stein, sound is a huge driving force in our ability to forgive fidelity of image. Um, that's why I'm really insistent on using lavalier microphones so that you get really good sound recording. If you can understand the voice and you get a good recording, the quality of the image is suddenly less important um, or you don't even notice it because you have better uh, quality sound. Um, and that's something they were talking about in context of using ambient sound to bridge the sort of gaps um, in quality. Um, and then second to that is light. Um, if you have good light, it, you can almost use any HD camera, and it will be incredibly impressive uh, how the, the quality fares. Um, it becomes competitive with um, some of the, the higher-end models of cameras out there. We, um, I'll show you some samples of what we did at IMA, so you can really see that you can do great work with very little um, 
the money. The second is stability. Um, a lot of the time when you're seeing user-generated content, people are grabbing the handy cam and running around with it to document things. I'm not opposed to taking the camera into your hands, um, especially as a conservator, you might need to move around an object uh, to capture some specific issue that's happening, maybe something's deteriorating in a particular way, and you need to sort of move around it to really see the depth of what's happening. I think the question that needs to be asked is, do I absolutely need to pick up the camera to show what I'm trying to explain? And then perhaps setting that camera back down um, to maybe uh, have a contextualization where you're explaining to, um, the, the future viewer uh, what you're about to show them. And so um, it's, it's, you know, there, there are the simple tenets of production. You have to plan. Um, you want to write out the things you want to explain beforehand. Doing run-throughs, that was something we found was really critical at IMA, is we would do one, two run-throughs, and then we would record. And we would get really great content on that third, um, that third session of recording. And so one of these was a handheld um, because we were doing a tour. And um, we wanted to show all the different spaces in the con conservation science lab. And so they did a couple of run-throughs to figure out like what's the best path to show all the things I want to show about our lab. Um, and then once you have that run through, you also have your, um, your script worked out, right? And so we don't have time to sit down and do production if we're not going to interrupt the, con the, the conservator's workflow. We want this to be relatively easy, but taking a, you know, another couple minutes to do a walkthrough of what you're going to talk about. And then the last element, of course, is the camera. And so um, I took some, snapped some pictures. Uh, so that little cord uh, to the right is this the little cable that um, KVM sells, and then a uh, lavalier microphone. Your light can be a desk lamp. Um, these are just track lights. Um, it's th These cameras uh, do really well in low light. You do want to get as much light as you can, and so what we were doing um, at IMA was just taking, usually conservators have a lot of light around so that they can see objects. So the idea is take that light and use it to your advantage. Point it towards your workspace, point it towards your subject if you have someone doing a demonstration. Um, so that you get a good, clear image. Um, this is the iPhone kit, so I have this little gorilla pod which you can uh, wrap around just about anything. Um, and then an iPhone or Android or any kind of smartphone that has camera capability, um, or even a, a flip camera. Um, they, they're a, lot of, um, a lot of people I've talked to shoot B-roll with flip cameras because if you have good light, it, the quality, once again, is much more forgiving. And so um, this is one of our setups at IMA. And so this was, um, you can see we have both cameras going because we were switching around between different cameras to experiment with different um, setups and qualities. And so we cheated by putting our gorilla pod onto the $20 tripod. Um, and so uh, on the top you have uh, Kristen Adsit, who is a graduate fellow in conservation of um, objects and variable art, uh, shooting Richard McCoy in front of the Irwin installation. And he's, um, this was one of our modes where it's a conservator explaining um, a certain process of preservation. And so what we did is came up with a list of different situations that we could um, test out uh, to see different uh, potentials for creating um, content. So this is another one we record. This is. Um, Kristen, and uh, apparently we don't have um, speakers in here, and so um, this was shot um, on an iPhone 4S. Um, the first step is generally to assess the structural stability of the work. In this case, I'm looking at um, this and so the, and the camera's static, so that we're not interrupted by the quality or anything um, that would distract you from the content, right? And the content is. Uh, Kristen explaining the process she goes through and examining an object. Um, so some of the videos we were making are pretty basic. Um, they're, they're really for aimed more for students of conservation. Um, and then we're also looking at um, certain ways that uh, conservators can incorporate this as kind of a lab notebook, where um, part of your process is photographing objects um, before treatment and after treatment. But what happens if you take the camera and do a verbal walkthrough? Um, of, uh, uh, of that object um, uh, so that we can see um, at, or other conservators can see a very particular situation that you're um, confronted with. So we did um, 
a few uh, videos like this where it's um, kind of what we call the, the talking head mode, where it's somebody explaining a, um, a project that, that they're in the middle of working on it, whether it's cleaning or an examination, a uh, particular treatment. Um, and so uh, all of these videos were shot um, by conservators, um, in, uh, either from the, their own department or, or neighboring uh, laboratories, so that the, the whole idea is it's not about me as a video producer coming in and, and uh, shooting a conservator at work, but conservators incorporating this, me sort of uh, facilitating uh, uh, an understanding that these things are really easy and accessible and can be incorporated as part of a conservator's practice. And I think there's a great potentiality of this beyond um, conservation reel in terms of how we think about our practices as museum professionals and sharing very specific things we discover. Um, Dale uh, Concrete has that uh, has a blog going where he occasionally has these videos that are really great, rough. Like somebody has a handy cam, and I, I emailed him about this. I was like, "Are you guys just shooting these on a handy cam yourself?" Yeah, absolutely, of course. That's why it looks like that. But taking um, control of the sharing of knowledge um, through video because it really enables you to understand exactly what's happening um, beyond what text can do. Um, and this, it's, it's. I don't think it's that. Um, revolutionary because it's something that's already happening on um, YouTube. And so this is um, one of these lab tours. And so what we did is we had um, Greg, the conservation scientist, um, place the lavalier microphone on himself, stuff the cable in his pocket, and do a handheld walking tour of his lab with the handy cam so that he's essentially creating a live voiceover. Um, and so this is a model that we used, um, started using a lot because it was something where, uh, it's something that would be very useful when you have a specific project that you want to share um, particular, you know, per uh, peculiarities maybe about a project um, yourself. And so it become, this is more in the function of a lab notebook where you would just pop on your microphone, take your handy cam, and give, give yourself um, notes essentially with a moving image. So, uh, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm doing great. Um, and so, oh, I'm like, oh, I can show more video. Um, and so, just because I showed the still, this is. Um, That's 12 minutes left. 12 minutes left, yeah. okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, how am I doing that? That's amazing. And so unfortunately we don't have speakers so you can't tell, but this microphone that's twenty dollars is impressive. It's, an, it's not unfortunately. That was made here at this museum for this museum for this very space. Uh, Bob would call this a site conditioned artwork. It's a kind of artwork that is only meant to exist in this very spot. And so what he's done is he's made it. And so I, I'm just blown away by the quality of these low end options. And once again, I, this is, you know, we brought in a light. And it's it took probably, I would say, 15 minutes to make this video. So um, the hope is that um, Conservation Reel, and let me go actually into the website, can be um, something that um, oh, it's already open. Um, can be a resource that's uh, create where, where conservators are creating the content to share, and that you don't need an in-house video crew to develop content for you. Yeah. In this case, I added titles um, because we were creating a model. Um, but uh, the idea I've been um, sharing with them, and I'm, I actually sent them the raw footage so they could start doing this, is in YouTube, um, there is um, the YouTube editor um, where you can really quickly, easily add your own titles. And that's something we're working on developing into this um, version of um, the Babel software, where you can be embedding via YouTube so that you're doing one takes. Um, all the videos I showed you were one take. And then bringing, bringing them straight off of the camera into YouTube and adding your title that's just an identifier. Who is this? What, you know, what department, what conservation department is it? And maybe if there are any featured works. Um, and then uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I don't know. 
Any questions? Yeah. Do you ever run into pushback from your marketing department, say, in terms of better branding, better quality, better messaging, or because it's housed in this kind of environment, does that not come up? Or? Um, I, I work with, because I work with Balboa Park on, Online Collaborative, um, I'm not tied to a particular institution, and so it really um, liberates me from that kind of pushback. Um, in the work I do at the San Diego Museum of Art, uh, we did have a little bit of a holdup this year, but it's actually coming around um, because they, they realized that they were actually throwing a wrench in the works of something that was really good for the museum because we were producing such a huge amount of content. And uh, in terms of um, conservation reel, that's something that we're trying to avoid and that's why we want it to be owned by the conservation departments as opposed to the museum itself. So that this is really, this is about professionals networking and sharing, idea sharing. Um, and information sharing as opposed to something that should be oriented towards marketing. Um, the hope is that perhaps that conservation department would share the footage with the marketing department and they could say, hey, if there's something you really like and want to put on Art Babel, this is something we actually sat down and had a conversation with the conservators and um, Emily Lytle Painter at IMA, who um, you know, is, is on the other end of things where she's producing the content for Art Babel that's got to be consumable and, visitor friendly and we're sort of like well this is this is for professionals this is for students this is for conservators this is um, for people who are um, you know the need it's really small museums who don't have an in-house conservator that need to know better collections care and that was one of our focuses with the Balboa Art Conservation Center because that's a big focus of theirs is collections care so we started uh, we're still in product and those are much more fully produced because I'm I'm behind them and so um, so I'm doing a lot of editing and um, you know terminology defining in those videos so that it can be something that's a resource to smaller museums on just how to store paper objects <laughs> how to um, protect a painting in hand transport um, and so so the hope is that it can be something that's a little more expansive like that yeah I, um, that, yep. that, uh, I'm like what Anna is, except I work more specifically for a museum, and uh, um, I'm a whole media project manager there, so I do a lot of the videos. And I get a lot of feedback from our PR department. Well, oh, it doesn't look like this, it doesn't look like that. But then, I get, um, then I'm getting like visitors and, and uh, docents and, and others saying, well, we want to put this online, or they, they couldn't make it to the lecture, they couldn't do this and that. And it's like, it's a lot of, you know, and I'm kind of stuck in the middle, so like, well, I, I can't put it online because the PR department doesn't want to put it online, things like that. So there's a lot of give and take, and, and right now we're, we're kind of struggling with that ourselves, so we're trying to figure out, well, should we create just a channel specifically for, say, lectures that necessarily don't have the, the I guess, the production quality that we would do for our, you know, PR videos, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that's all fancy and has a lot of animation, versus and I think it's something worth fighting for yeah. um, and that's and that's something I, I really strongly believe and that's why I really enjoy not working for a particular museum because I'm interested in sharing ideas and um, uh, knowledge not about promoting necessarily I love to make promotional videos because they're fun easy and it's eye candy it's they're, they're great but um, it's projects like this that actually change the landscape of how we work and, um, and I think that if people could be a little less scared, and just like, um, I, are, is anyone familiar, I hope, with UbuWeb? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so UbuWeb is this amazing resource for researchers, and one of um, the policies is ask forgiveness. Once he gets something in his hands, he puts it up there, and then takes it down if it's requested. And I think that um, uh, uh, operating you know, as best you can in everyone's interest, but also not letting yourself be restrained by sharing really good information is important, um, especially if it can save an object. Like if you find an amazing treatment process, why, why um, hide that intellectual property or wait until you can publish it? Um, you, you might be able to save another object that's made of the same material. I'm learning a lot about conservation in this process. <laughs> uh, so we've been uh, recently we've been producing very large and we came to the point where uh, our IT department was not ready to support hundreds of gigabytes 
exactly what that's going to be. Have you guys run into that issue? And if so, how are you addressing it about when you start creating this? It's, it's an issue. We just had a round table at this very table right before this about that problem of, of, of how do you deal with these files. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I'm an advocate of don't lose the, the, this moment of something that's happening and forge ahead and patchwork it as best you can. That's also why I upload everything to YouTube right away, even if it's unlisted or private. So that there's, um, in a way, a backup in the cloud um, because there is a copy saved on YouTube so that if you do lose everything because IT won't back up your drives. Um, but drives are cheap. Um, and if you're shooting on ABC HD and you're, you're editing in YouTube, I mean, the, it's, it's really not that much space in the long run if you stay compressed. It's not an archivist's dream. <laughs> like, I'm sure that would upset a lot of people. But if, you're, if, if you have a once-in-a-lifetime project on your on your table in your conservation lab why would you not grab an image of it um, it's you know there's at BACC they have everything still in slides and it's an insane amount of slides it's mind-blowing how many so I like I did for such a small conservation suit it wasn't what I expected um, but there's just racks and racks and racks of them they'll never get funding to digitize them is, is sort of their but they're not going to stop making them just because they need something unfortunately it's film so it's going to last a little longer um, but it's I mean I, I recognize that that's an issue but I've, I've been sort of saying forge ahead but it is a bigger conversation that I you know that we're that we're having is how do you deal with that um, those files yeah and then oh sorry go ahead oh. did you have a problem I mean, in the case, slash, the care department, we would kill it for this kind of But I think the hardest thing that we have is, is not getting buy in from the department, getting buy in from the servers and curators who, you know, already have the schedule of the work. Did you have, how did you work on this? Well, um, I'm, it's, it's, a, it's a negotiation with each lab. I visit. Um, IMA is very video friendly um, because they've all been put in front of a camera at some point and they were naturals with the camera. It was great. Everyone picked it up. No one was afraid to be in front of it or behind it for the most part. I mean, a couple people preferred not to have their faces, but it's very easy to set up an over the shoulder shot. Um, and so that's why I'm trying to incorporate ways of making it really easy. And that's why I also sell it as a lab notebook. Because if it becomes part of the process of um, like an acquisition to shoot a video analysis of a piece, that could that that's that's really important information, um, and it's something that advantages the process. And so, I think it's really important to remind people that this is a useful tool. It's not just busy work to get me some good video, um, and and it. I think making it easy is the best way. Um, using putting a web camera on a on a work table, so that you can get time lapse of a process on a on a painting would be an amazing project. And all you need to do is plug in that webcam. Um, and, and a lot of the webcams come with um, like cloud streaming capture, so that you can then just download it. I think if we can do Neil as the last question, Sorry. and we'll yeah. move on to Thank the you. next section and. Okay. Hopefully, have time to come back to any other questions at the end. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the rights that are associated with these videos? It's a really key thing. If you want to talk about sharing open knowledge, are these, you know, these videos available with CC licenses so they can be matched and remixed and shared across the landscape? Or are servers being more protected with the video content? Well, um, with um, IMA, we um, put the um, Creative Commons. Uh, license right there at the end because we think that is really important, that they're incredibly shareable, it's open, and to get away from that issue. Um, I haven't, once again, is, will there be pushback? I'm sure from certain labs there's going to be a bit of a fear of that because there's there's the, always the panic, it's just like um, a registrar's panic over what if it's captured on tape the moment something terrible happens, you know, like that's that's a scary thing. And I, but. But if we, if we start to make things more comfortable and video a part of the practice, I think you start to get over that, that panic. Um, but, yeah. The word is copyright. Yeah. 
The Irwin. Well, we we do uh, we have the copyright information at the end, and it's one. Of, it's the ask forgiveness later. Um, it's we we cite everything as it should be cited according to the website, and so it's. Um, we and or the conservators direct us to where that copyright information is, the gifting information, so that we get all the credit lines into there. But it's definitely something that could be an issue. But the hope is that you're working in a way that this is for professionals, right? And so it's educative. It's not about um, promoting a work. Fair use. Do you, do you follow the fair use category? Yeah, essentially, yeah. Yeah, that that um, it shouldn't be a concern. Okay. Right. Okay. So now, thank you for round one. <laughs> oh gosh, no, no. <laughs> round two, get ready. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, all right. It, I really wanted to start with this and lead into the other one, but I wanted to stick to the schedule in the program because now I'm sort of stepping back to. Um, the, the video department and people producing video content in museums. Um, and there was this really great presentation last year, if anyone um, managed to get to um, Andy Underwood and Jesse Heisman's um, presentation on video production. And they went over like video production on the whole. Um, and it's sort of like pre-production, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty of how you produce content. And they both are in situations where they have really great cameras, they have LTO backup systems, they have money. <laughs> Most museums don't have money. Um, I started at BPOC almost a year ago, and there was an HMC 150 camera and uh, a handheld wireless microphone. And I'm pretty sure, oh, and an on-camera shotgun, and, that was, and, and the, the, a crappy Liebeck tripod, and that was it. And I thought, you guys want to build a video production department? This is going to be rough. Um, we don't have the money to do this. Um, but then I and the, but then I I had to step back. I came I, I, I went to film school. Um, I, I learned about production for television and for um, uh, actual film film, and so it's we we need to rethink the model instead of turning to um, cinema as our source and to television as our source of like what we're striving to be. Um, most museums are producing for web, and that's where it ends. Um, you're producing for uh, 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 archiving uh, knowledge, right? Lectures and uh, public programs. So um, I immediately thought of Marshall McLuhan when I was trying to come up with a witty title for my uh, proposal, and um, I had to go back and reread it because it had been a while. Um, and I remember, the, oh right, the, okay, the core of the article, the medium is the message. And it's the medium that shapes and controls the scale and form of human association and action. And so the way we consume video is mostly through a laptop. Um, most people I know don't even have televisions anymore and they consume all television and media through their computer. And so this is becoming, this is, this is the, the medium um, that we're producing for. And so looking, Looking at um, ideal production, I mean, it still obviously has a place. There's, you know, we want to make cinema, we want to make um, good content for um, television documentary. Uh, it depends on the context, but those are budget projects. They're big projects. As a small museum that wants to start producing content, or at least not losing events that are happening every day, um, this isn't a good model to work off of because it's based on this idea that. Um, you have big cameras, you have good lights, you're going to get a really great image, and, um, and, and you have all this pre-production time. Like, there's just this, this excessive amount of time and money and um, ability to do things. And, and there, you know, a lot of um, museums will hire out for their promotional content because they don't have that kind of um, resources in-house. Um, but this, I just don't think these are the models that, as a museum, we should be um, looking to, to to base our, our productions. Um, and I think these are really important. Like looking at R21, those documentaries are amazing. But there's a lot of people behind it. I made sure to list the credits on this, just to sort of think about the fact that most um, smaller, I, I mean, even a lot of the bigger museums, it's one person running the show. Like at the um, McNay or me at BPOC, where I'm actually, it's not just one museum, it's a bunch of museums that I'm trying to uh, capture content for. And so, um, that's when I came up with this idea of real production. What's actually happening out there? And so I started, I first got in touch with Andy at the Walker and said, hey, that was a really awesome presentation you did. 
you know, how, how did you come up with the money? What do you think about production today and like how your model is really unfeasible for most people? And we had this really great conversation and in a lot of ways he's in a similar position to me except that he has access to great equipment and can hire contractors to shoot things. Um, but then I was thinking about the kind of content I produce um, in um, Balboa Park, and I just see that my little bit got cut off, but um, this was shot with a Canon uh, 5D Mark II, and I think it looks really, I mean, the screen doesn't give it good uh, representation, but it's, it's got a really nice richness, it's got a cinema look, and that package is really inexpensive. And so we can produce promotional content um, as well as gather um, information that's happening at museums all the time. And so it goes back to what I was talking about before with the conservation reel, elements of production, got to get good sound, got to have good light, and um, you need to have a, a good tripod and um, a decent camera. In this case, we're looking at prosumer um, models. And so looking at sound, um, a wireless microphone, $630 for your basic Sennheiser kit. It's not that bad if you're starting up a production. I, there, there are lower price points for this. I'm just sort of looking at what we use to, to get by. Um, for light, light kits um, can run you anywhere from 150 bucks to 750 bucks. Um, and th 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 these are basic, but it's the core stuff that's going to help you to capture um, decent content if you want to start producing content. Um, for stability, I'm a huge fan of, and this is what um, uh, uh, Vicky at the Tang uses, is the Manfrotto 504 HD tripod with the 426B legs. Um, it's, it's an expensive tripod, but I can actually move the camera without it looking like hell. Um, and that's what you find with these little tripods. It's very challenging to get a good image. If you're on a budget, you can go down from there, but you're going to have to start having a static camera. Um, and so then looking at what kind of content you're producing. Are you primarily documenting lectures or um, art performances, things where you don't have that much control or time? Um, in which case, you're looking at a package more like what we have in the corner of this room. Um, in our case, we use a HMC 150. And I did a side-by-side -side comparison with that camera and the EX1, which is a much higher-end camera. And these, these, these lower budget cameras really have a fighting chance. Even this little camera does an amazing job. This one's 750. And I, I mean, all the conservation reel footage we got looked beautiful. And most of it we didn't have good lighting for. So um, the, the possibilities have been really opened up by consumer equipment. Um, the cheap version of the Mark II is the T2i, um, which is a really inexpensive camera package and gets really great footage. All you need is a good lens. Um, I have all the sense space too. I was talking to about this, but um, we were talking earlier. It's it, it's better to have a really good lens if you're if you want to get pretty footage um, than to worry about having a Mark II body. So get a T2i and then get the $400 um, 50 millimeter lens or the $2,000 um, zoom lens that's like uh, 24 millimeter to 75 millimeter. I can get like really um, into the details <laughs> of of um, the content. But so that's like the technical like nerding out on equipment. There's a lot of options out there, and that's what I really want to underscore to like get started on producing content. Um, so producing content, it's it's back to that presentation last year: pre-production, production, post-production. Post you should write a script, have a shot list, um, and when you're shooting, get your B-roll. Make sure to gather your images from um, whomever is speaking. If they reference um, a particular painting get that painting. If you're producing for a marketing department, then find out the rights information, the gifting information, all the credit lines. Um, and then I, I have a whole tirade about post-production, but I'll keep it brief. Um, but when I say a script, a lot of people don't know where to start. And um, it's really something as simple as this. This is a pro was a promotional video we just shot. It's not in post-production yet, but for um, the Spanish Village Art Center, which is like an arts and crafts center in Balboa Park. We just needed a list of like what are the inner titles, what are the core things we're going to talk about in this video, and then what are the images we need to get. So that the right column is essentially a shot list, and the left column is any narration that needs to happen, or um, voiceover, or things maybe you're going to get later. And um, it doesn't need to be that complicated. You need somewhere to start. Depending on the project, you may need to have more of a, a full script. But this is, this is where you sort of get to enter in the door of producing um, content. Um, and so um, for post-production, um, uh, some of you may have heard Final Cut is over. I believe it is. Um, I have sworn off Apple products. Um, and 
what was great was we managed to get um, uh, uh, one in an auction a copy of Avid. And so when I started at BPOC, there was no uh, system in place, right? I got to start from scratch, dream situation. You're not like walking into somebody else's mess. Um, so we got, I got to sample out um, Premiere and Avid and work on both platforms as a Final Cut user, as like a, somebody who is really fresh to both softwares. And depending on what kind of content you're producing, like if you're making stuff that is gonna be heavily edited and um, you're, you're working on one system for one client, Avid is a great piece of software. It's also really expensive. Um, and to, to use it to its full effectiveness, you're gonna wanna get a lot of hardware with it. If you're just getting started, you really don't need that. Premiere Pro is an incredibly effective piece of software and it fits in really seamlessly with all the other Adobe products. And so if your graphics department is using Photoshop, it's gonna be a lot easier um, to move around between these softwares if you're using Premiere. The other thing I really love about Premiere is it eats footage natively really well. So back to the file space issue, you don't have to transcode, you save a ton of space. You're just popping the card in, copying the whole card, and then editing in Premiere. Um, obviously, I, um, I also believe in using really basic consumer technologies or shooting one takes um, as, as an informal way of production, but when we're talking about formalized production, I think Premiere is a really effective and great tool to save space, and then you're only worrying about your export in terms of having a high quality. Um, archive, like that's a whole can of worms, but archive copy of your video. Um, so this is um, the, the micro-production workflow. This is how we deal with um, footage at BPOC. And so basically, bringing your AVC in, you edit, and then you export, you have your high quality, your YouTube, your iTunes, and then you back all, all of that up, your projects, your raw footage, and your exports in three locations. Um, you have your work drive, where everything is. You have your backup, which should be at least a RAID 5. And then you have your backup of your backup, LTO 5 tape. Um, I don't think it hurts to have a second server somewhere else. Um, one of these things, like the tapes should come home with you, or like they don't want to all be in the same building that burns down and you've lost everything you've ever made. So um, locations. Um, so work drives at BPOC, server, we're in the process of having it move so that it's at the museum, which is at the far end of the park, so that we're on opposite sides of the park, and then the tapes come home with me. I'd like to mail them to it like another city, but um, we'll, we'll, you know, it's the nature of video people to be paranoid about files. Um, but then I, okay, so now, okay, now that I've done this phase two of technical nitty gritty, I um, quickly want to just talk about types of production. I sort of mentioned it earlier, documentation tends to be a little crappier. It's just about gathering lectures, archiving intellectual content, and then um, you have your, you know, educational produced content, so like curator talking about painting um, in front of painting in the gallery, or um, art educator telling about exhibition, um, and then promotional content, where it's much more about creating something slick. There's a fourth kind of content that I think we need to start to develop, and this goes back to the idea of the medium of the masses, and that's informal content. And this is the kind of content I was talking about with <laughs> Conservation Reel, where I think we need to really bring uh, crappy cameras, little consumer cameras, they're actually really great cameras into the museum space um, for, you know, it's, I don't even want to say video blogging because it's like icky, you know, it's like, that sounds hard, it sounds like work, and it's just like, it's got a bad connotation, but I think that it really is something that's incredibly useful, informal conversations um, with informal uh, technology. Um, so here's a you know amazing documentation of a lecture. They're always too dark. They always look crappy. Um, and what we do is we cut in the slides as opposed to shooting the screen. Um, more expensive for the museum, but they get a much better product. Um, we the, once again, I have the benefit of working as an outsider to the museum, and so we have a little. I can push them to do things that I think are a little better. We also do in-gallery public program lectures. So um, I think if you already have a standing like in-gallery lecture, it's a great place to start practicing with like a little handy cam, just capturing these kinds of events so that you're starting to produce content. Um, and then once you start to have content, your education department gets a hunger. Um, that's what happened with SDMA when I was a freelancer. We sort of got the hunger going by me coming in and editing some footage they already had. And they were like, wow, these are great. It's like, well, the footage is really bad. You should hire me to shoot it next time. And then. That was how I came in as a freelancer to start helping them to um, 
produce better content. Um, and the promotional videos we shoot, they're not, it's not like they're brilliant quality. They're, I mean, they're shot on the Mark II, they're goofy, they're funny, they're kind of hipstery. Um, but uh, it, it's kind of the style of, of the series they were working on. And so then we, I think this is where video makers get to have a lot of fun art performance documentation, especially durational performances. Um, you can really play as a producer, and it also, um, I think, opens up your museum's eyes to the potential of video to capture things that are happening every day in the museum. Um, I'm, a, I'm a really strong advocate of art performance documentation. It's also a personal interest of mine. And it, How do we recreate an experience when you're not there? How do you capture um, these performances? Um, education space videos. Um, now players are digital. We, we, um, I just got the museum to finally invest in um, the Western Digital TV1 players. They're only a hundred bucks. All you need to do is plop your video on a little jump drive, stick it on the front, and then uh, HDMI to um, your LCD screen. You've got content. Or iPads. Um, we also display things like this on iPads. And so we're in it, we're approaching a completely media media list. It's just files moving around. It's just thumb drives. Um, and so uh, it's, it's a really great time to be producing uh, content because there's a lot of flexibility. Um, so this is the public programs education produced content. And so these are, this is where like we want to get, right, is the, the, the typical art babble content where it's um, documenting an artist in process or a curator or historian in front of a work. And uh, let's see, I was going to burst out of here and show some things, but we're close on time. All right, let's just look at one thing. So, about 13 minutes left just to get Okay, in total, right? Yeah. Okay. So, this is um, something IMA produced, and this was all shot on Mark II. We have a very similar system, except they Almost, it's all Mark II and flip cameras. Um, uh, and so that's, one of these things is sort of reaching out to other museums to see what they use when they're on a tight budget. And it's been really interesting to see that a lot of us are using the exact same equipment. Um, so many museums are using the, the Canon Mark II because it, it allows you to produce really nice looking um, content. Um, not the best for handheld, but um, it, it does a, a good job. So this, I mean, this is also just a really beautiful performance. So once again, really great content um, can drive it. So. I, gosh, I wish I could remember what Emily said. I don't think it, I, I don't, I know they don't have one and I don't think it is. But it also does, it's, they've got to have some kind of weight balance system. You know, the, the um, for the Mark II you can get really nice weight balance systems so it feels more like a, a, a real camera. Um, as opposed to a tiny little thing. Um, and then going back to San Diego Museum of Art, um, and so we don't, we didn't even have lights in these situations. And so what you do is you end up positioning your curator or your historian in the light of the painting um, to, to work the best you can out of a situation. And so it's, you can patchwork a lot of these things just to get good um, content. And in this case, he's giving the talk in Spanish. Um, so we uh, had to subtitle it. But it was, I mean, most of these exhibitions tend to be really dark, especially paintings exhibitions. And so placing your curator, your historian, your educator right in front of the painting and then doing your cutaways is a way to work around that. Um, no, this was actually from a private collection. And so he was backing the production of these videos for them. Oh, right, no, they, we haven't been flagged yet. It's the, SDMA always asks forgiveness. Um, <laughs> they just had to pull all their O'Keefe videos. Um, <laughs> so um, it's, uh, it's, and that's kind of what, I, that's why I like working with the education department because they're, they want to produce good content. 
so we don't have to, we don't fuss about those things until they become an issue, and then we deal with it after the fact. Obviously, if you can, it's helpful <laughs> to have all that credit information in advance, and that's why I recommend of making it part of your practice to gather all the credit information and gifting information. Do you think that as to states can eventually see the positive outcome of this kind of video production, especially for educational contexts, and that it will continue to challenge them to rethink their Absolutely. I think the best kind of thing to document are contemporary shows, especially with living artists, because A, you get to make really great content with living artists. IMA has a ton of, um, you know, like not just performances, but also artists working in their studio. Um, and I get really jealous of them because the San Diego Museum of Art, my only chance is the um, Summer Salon Performance Series and it's only in performance. So it's very rare that we get to um, produce content like that because you, you're actually you get to open the door and it's much more exciting to see an artist process um, even though we're, we're used to doing that I mean it really is one of the more exciting ways of um, gathering content when you have a visiting artist um, any other questions how, how much when did you get to the idea that if it's not reported with images or video that it didn't happen especially in digital culture this is the environment I have respect for Tino Segal. I mean, that's it's a really cool uh, way of navigating our, our like the contemporary way of, of documenting everything to completely resist and ban it like he did. Um, I um, as an artist, I'm, I hate documentation. I, I refuse to document installations I make because it never captures the experience. Instead, I do very abstract forms of documentation. Um, so it's yeah, I think that's a it's an interesting uh, yeah. If the tree falls, no one's there to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Now you mentioned uh, having the run throughs as a way to kind of help get that first take the first time. Oh yeah, with conservation. Any other tips? Tips. Oh, um, so uh, check your sound. Like right after you you do your first little setup. If you, especially if you don't, okay, headphones. I didn't put that on my list. Headphone, even if they're crappy iPod headphones, you need to be listening to that sound. You never know when somebody's scarf is just scraping the heck out of the mic. And your sound is the most important part. I, I beat it over my interns' heads all the time when they're helping me. I'm like, did you check the sound? And look at me like, oh, no. <laughs> Like you gotta have your headphones on, and and really, um, with an iPhone, it's it's especially important because this weird cable situation. Um, when I do a recording, I do a test, and then I listen to it to make sure I'm getting sound, and then I record the video, and I check after each video I record because you have to unplug this to plug your headphones in to um, listen to your sound. There's higher end mics you can get for iPhones where you can monitor your sound. They're like three hundred dollars. Um, <laughs> I wasn't about to invest it. Um, <laughs> Any other questions? I could give a million little video tips, but I think getting a, a video production book, watching a bunch of how-to videos on YouTube, because it's it's familiarizing yourself with the territory. But I think the more you do, the, the better you get at it. Everyone I've talked to, all the other video producers I've talked to at small museums are like, wow, the content I produced when I first started here is so embarrassing. I can't show it to you. And I was like, I totally understand. I hate the Stella Nay painting because it was the first video I ever shot with the San Diego Museum of Art. Even as a knowledge producer, when you first start with a new organization, with new equipment, you're always going to have mistakes. and You just have to be ready to take those blows and learn from them. Um, we're always making mistakes. And I think that's true of all professional practices. It's acknowledging those and using them to learn and sharing them as opposed to like sweeping them under the carpet. Um, that's why I'm trying to be really open about my practice because I know it's not the best way. It's just, I think it's important to start the dialogue. Um, and so uh, bringing video makers together, yeah. Um, how do you, you know, one of the things that we have um, a problem with is some people create all happen and then they don't have all yeah. of a sudden we're sitting in the galleries to document it. Like we just had a little bit of an installation that was about a half week, and suddenly another curator was like, oh yeah, that'd be great, we need a video of this. We totally weren't prepared, we didn't have a script or anything, and so we just tried to shoot as much B-roll and as much interviews as we could to maybe magically produce something. I mean, is there a, I mean, is there a good workflow to, after you have a bunch of footage to develop a story with it? Or? 
Absolutely. Well, and I have that problem too. I always get the last minute call. And what I do is um, uh, transcribe your interviews and use those to write a script after you've shot everything. Um, and then make sure you have someone on hand who can do voiceover um, in case you need the voiceover to be a narrator to patchwork everything together. But transcribing and writing a script after you've shot is incredibly useful. I do it all the time. Even for short little one minute videos, I'll, I'll send stuff. Um, you can send it through, I've just spaced on the website. There's a really inexpensive, it's a dollar a minute, I think. Is that right? Yeah, it's a dollar a minute, um, and you just send them an audio file, and they send you a transcription back in like a day. I'm s totally spaced. I'll, I'll find it. Um, it's, I'll, I'll email it or tweet it later. Um, but uh, I, I really I, writing and storytelling is still the core of production. I get caught up in the technical, um, but you're still um, you're still stuck in storytelling. Um, and it's, I don't think stuck is the right word. It's, that's, that's really what we're doing um, when we make videos and remembering that um, even as a document, it's telling a story. This air conditioner reminds me about sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, they are building this concrete and glass, and it, I mean, it is impossible to get a clean sound, even if we have expensive mics and everything. Um, for air handlers, I, um, I like to work a deal with the facilities crew. Um, they, um, <laughs> they, you know, obviously we need to protect artworks in a museum, but 15 minutes off isn't so bad, right? And so if you can coordinate with them and time it. Um, the other thing I've done is taken people to another location to shoot uh, an interview at a completely different controlled environment. Um, outside of the gallery. Um, but in terms of fighting it, the best you can do is highest end mic. Um, hopefully you can get the air handlers turned off by your facilities crew for the 15 minutes you're shooting. Um, and then um, as far as echo, um, moving blankets. Like just lay down a bunch of moving blankets, <laughs> especially if it's, you know, like terrazzo floor, um, because that really helps um, the bounce. Um, but yeah, choosing another location for interviews is also good. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, every, every, as we're switching over, if people want to grab some water, there are more seats down here. Yeah, people should cozy up, fill in, fill in the gaps. Do you mind if we actually switch spots? Yeah, no, that's why I was, I was just closing out so none of my stuff is in your way. And let me get all this out of the way. And I just also want to remind people that um, since we are recording it, when you ask questions, just make sure to project because we don't have speakers around. Yeah. <laughs> so just those non-amplified mics and a lot of air conditioner noise. I know. And they're pointed right at the air conditioner. The mics are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Good. You never know. <laughs> Just grab a little water. You might need your help. Oh, yeah. Partway during the uh, presentation. Anything you need. It's going to be easy. Okay. I won't sell you in half. Okay. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> Make sure you project those if you have anything, okay. um, just since the mics don't actually project sure. at all. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to stand up for this one. Yeah. Okay.
You guys ready? Last session of the day, and then drinks. Yay! Right? Last session? Yep. yep. All right. Close it out. Let's do it. My name is Michael Nault. I'm a media and content producer at Second Story Interactive Studios. And uh, today I will be talking about maps, interactivity, and storytelling. And uh, I was really pleased with Curtis Wong's talk this morning because he sets up this presentation very elegantly. And uh, a lot of the things that he was talking about were actually map-based or geospatial-based. Um, but he made the storytelling side of things seem very easy. So I want to talk about how you actually get to that point of doing storytelling for interactive maps. I want to start out with a quote. Every map is a fiction. Every map offers choices. And this is a quote from DJ Waldy, who is a historian out of LA. And this is represented, uh, representative of the structure that I want to take for this talk, in that the first part is all about fiction. The first part is all about stories. And the second part is all about the different choices that happen when you are exploring a map. And that is what I think of as the interactivity of map making. So I'm going to start out with uh, a series of historic examples, and then I'm going to move into some more contemporary digital examples, and hopefully uh, weave in some best practices and advice for people who are looking to make maps themselves. So let me just start out by saying that I love maps. <laughs> so this is basically the best day ever for me because I get to talk about maps and I have a rapt audience. And uh, this is a picture of me from this past summer. I took a 10-day swimming hole adventure in southern Oregon and we were completely off the grid. So all we had were analog paper maps. And I realized at the end of the trip, as I was telling people stories about this trip, what I would do is I would actually unfold this giant topographic map of Southern Oregon, and then I would tell stories based on pointing to actually where I was on the map, and then I would augment those stories with pictures from my phone. So what I was realizing was that people were actually enlightened by seeing where I was on this map. So I can say, oh yeah, I was in the middle of nowhere. But if I'm actually showing you that I'm here by Crater Lake, 300 miles away from anything, people get that all of a sudden. So I just wanted to start out with that personal anecdote. And today I'm specifically going to be focusing on storytelling and maps and narrative. And uh, I wanted to talk about what makes narrative maps different. There's three different things that I see that make storytelling integral to maps. And um, we're looking at time and sequencing. So that's the storytelling element for cartography. And I'm not going to be talking about just wayfinding. So these aren't really about tour guides. This is really more about something that's transcending how do you get from point A to point B. So when I talk about story, I wanted to bring up this little chart. This is something that people probably recognize from high school, creative writing class. And as we're going through this, I want to think about how do you take a very common structure for fiction storytelling and apply that to cartography. So this is the fictions part of the talk. And I hope that this is not just bringing up uh, something of a history lesson, and I hope that as we're going through some of these examples, we're actually thinking about them more as archetypes or genres, and could hopefully inspire you to think differently about uh, your content and things that might have uh, geographic possibilities. This first map is of the Pony Express. It's from the 1960s, and it charts the entire journey. And this is what I like to call the expedition map. This is a really good opportunity for map making because you're going from uh, one section of the world to the other, and you have all these opportunities for storytelling. And let me just bring up a close-up of this map so you can see exactly what's going on. So it's not just, um, <clears throat> it's not just a map because you're seeing all these different vignettes around it and you're getting an opportunity 
to see along the Pony Express some of the things that were actually happening. The next map is what I like to call the layer cake map, where you're seeing a whole multitude of things going on at the same time. So this is a 1905, it's a map of Panama Canal. First section is illustrative, so you're getting a sense of how many people are working on it. The second one is diagrammatic, so you're seeing how much work has been done. This is a profile of the, the Panama Canal. How much work has been done, how much work is being done at the moment, and then this whole chunk is how much work is left to be done. So I thought that was really interesting. And the last section is the um, topographic profile. So this blends into interactivity because you get to choose what you're looking at. And that is a close-up of that map. So this is what I like to call comparative geography. This is uh, us, this is looking at the different principal lengths of rivers and mountains in the world. And uh, I think this is a really enlightening element of geography. And you could kind of see this during Curtis Wong's talk this morning, when you see our solar system and then you pull back <laughs> and you see our, our solar system in relation to all these other solar systems. So I think that's a really enlightening thing. It's something that cartography does really well. And here's a close-up of that. This is 1853, before we understood that Mount Everest was actually the tallest mountain. This is one of my favorite map makers. This is a guy named Joe Mora. And this is what I would call the illustrative map. This is the, uh, called the Sweetheart of the Rodeo. And you're seeing geography as it relates to a fictional rodeo. And then you're seeing all these different themes that are re related to the rodeo and cowboys. So you've got different things about saddles and different horses. And if anybody's a fan of the birds here, this is the origin of the birds cover the sweetheart of the rodeo, which is just this little bit right there. So these are incredibly dense maps. And if you like the style of this, I, I do recommend that you go look him up. It's lovely stuff. The next couple maps I want to talk about are what I like to think of as treasure maps. And this is actually a book and paper from a book called The Bamboo Bird. And what I like about these is that when you are reading a story, it gives you just a hint. It gives you a mental model of the geography. It doesn't give you too much information, but if you're reading this book, then you understand where the pig's yam field is in relation to the lake. And it doesn't seem like much, but as you're reading it, it gives you an ability to understand geospatial relationships. I also think of this as similar to being the, um, it's kind of a kindred spirit of, like I was saying, the treasure map, um, because you're kind of imagining it in your mind and you're building these experiences. Uh, also related to the treasure map is the idea of geocaching, very popular thing. and. Uh, Kids love it, so I think of geocaching basically as a contemporary example of the treasure map. And um, the next slide is one of my very favorite treasure maps. So the last historical examples I want to show bleed in directly into interactivity, and these are different types of atlases. So this one is from um, the Eameses. One second, actually. So they cumulatively bring together this idea of atlases and data visualizations. And what they're doing is, this is the type of thing that you might see in a Rand McNally atlas or a penguin atlas. And this is actually a video. So what they're showing is the rise and fall of the Roman Empire over time. Let's see if I can actually bring up this video. And the link is not working, but that's okay. So basically what they're doing is they're showing the layering of information 
as it goes over time. So it's a data visualization that's a sequence. But I think the really interesting thing here is that typically in atlases, you get a sequence of images. But then you kind of have to put it together in your mind. And what the Eameses did is they put all of those series and they layered it all on top of one another. And then they put it in motion with video. And I see that's what interactivity is really good at and what it does really well. So moving into the interactive portion, this is what I like to think of as choices. Because you truly are creating your own path as, you're, as you are interpreting these maps. So before we get into this, I just want to make a little disclaimer that making maps is challenging. It can be very expensive. So I want to talk about what it takes before you actually get into it. And uh, if I had to sell this or if I had to pitch this as to a department head, I would call up three different things that I think are really great about maps. I think there's a certain immediacy. When you walk up to a map, within 60 seconds, you understand completely what is going on. I think there's a very memorable quality to maps. So we're talking about this mental model. In terms of education, it's very, very easy to remember the visuals related to maps. And uh, lastly, there's a cinematic quality to maps. And I think there's a very good reason that many, many movies start out with like a fly through and situate you geographically. So if you think of the beginning of The Shining, that's basically a bird's eye view of Oregon as they're flying in. So moving into different best practices. So first step you're going to want to do uh, when you're about to make a map is basically take a content survey. This is what I call the uh, humble beginnings of any good map. Uh, some of the things that I would be looking for is the volume of content that you might have. You know, do you have 10 stories? Do you have 30 stories? So really just analyzing how much content you are trying to represent. Second thing I would look at is, do you have the data? Because oftentimes people will go into a project and they'll say, I want to make this kind of map, but they don't have it. So creating data is something that you really need to consider for your budget as you're moving into it. And then lastly, once you do figure out your data, are you working with a 2D set of data or are you working with a 3D? 3D obviously would be a much more expensive challenge uh, in terms of who's working with it, but then also in terms of your navigation is going to be vastly, vastly different. So then um, two more bits of advice that I would give as you're doing your content survey is once you've figured out how much you have, start consolidating. One of the, I think, um, one of the biggest pitfalls with map making is that you can put everything on it. If you're just writing it out, it's easy to narrow it down. Um, so what I would say is consolidate your content and make sure you're just putting the essence of the story in there. So this is a project that I did uh, along the second story for Mount St. Helens. And this is a kiosk that is exploring the revegetation that happened uh, surrounding the volcano after the explosion. And uh, this is us doing wireframes and getting all of our geographic content together. And in this next slide, we're getting all of our stories and our relationships together. So basically, we're figuring out our strategy. We're figuring out how do the stories relate to the geography, because you need to have a very, very strong cohesion between those two. So what I would recommend here is before you go into any sort of active development, do an actual outline. Map it all out and figure out how do these things relate to one another. You can see here, there's also a couple other sections where we're figuring out actually how much content we've got. So we're trying to put this all in, um, uh, in a document before we actually develop it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the types of people that you would want to work with on this, because 
we're in a state, we're in an era where maps are no longer raster images. Maps are data-driven. And as you consider that, you're going to be wanting to work with a different type of team. So it's not just graphic designers. You're going to be wanting to work with engineers, developers, producers. And as you survey your content, it's going to give you a better sense of who you want to work with. Uh, and my first bit of advice would be recognize when to seek help from specialists. Uh, I know from experience that I often just try and get over my head really quickly and try to figure out things that I should not be figuring out. And um, things can get very complex very quickly. So this is my little graph representing complexity in terms of your budget. So I'll just say, try and figure that stuff out beforehand because it's very easy to get too many people involved with a mapping project. So I wanted to show this image. This is the, the final comp from the Mount St. Helens Interactive. And I wanted to show the different layers that actually went into it to demonstrate how many different types of people worked on it. So we have a topographic layer, we have a vegetation layer, we have what we call the disturbance layer, and a textures layer. And these were all created by different people. So in this last image, it's completely seamless. But when you look at it, it's all different types of disciplines. So you have an engineer, you have a cartographer, you have a designer, and yet another, uh, this was created by a scientist. So four different people working on that, plus a producer. OK, so to avoid things like your budget skyrocketing, one of the things that I say is apply your content using lo-fi tools. And so what are some of the things that you can use? Um, Google Earth is a great thing to use to just kind of sketch ideas. It has a way that you can map different points. Uh, there's a program called Batch Geo, which is also excellent. And you can take information from a spreadsheet and just put that data on a Google map. The, um, my personal favorite bit for this is actually paper prototyping. And I wanted to show you guys an example of how that could potentially work. And so. When I say paper prototyping, I literally just mean drawing things on paper. So what I did was I have an iPad screen, and I just sketched out what a potential interface could be. And then if it's map-based, you can just print out your map. You could bring this in front of whoever the uh, subject specialist is for this. You want to hold that for a second? Yeah. And then you can look at things kind of comprehensively and really just sketch things out. So let's say this is a Charles Lindbergh interactive. Uh, here's all your content. Here's the Atlantic Ocean. You know, what happens? Which way are things oriented? What sort of information do you want to use? Um, are things a flat interface? How does zooming work? So I think this is a really good way to make things very, very real if you're working with a scientist or a curator immediately. So you can also show things like, what happens if you zoom way out, you know, or zoom way in, what's going to happen to your interface? So I love paper prototyping, and all this is is uh, transparency paper and a printout. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hold it now. Yes. <laughs> what are we doing now? Uh, we've got just over 10 minutes left. Okay. So I want to talk about a little bit of usability stuff. Uh, this is a personal favorite of mine. This is a journey along Kilimanjaro that the New York Times did. And it's very clean. And what you see when you actually access the site is there is a fly through. And you get to see his entire journey. Uh, the thing that I like about this is that you're getting that expedition archetype, but then you're also getting all of this different layering. But none of this ever disappears. You can get to any point at any time in the journey. So essentially, it's a slideshow, but it's very elegantly done and very cleanly done. One of the things that I was thinking about as we're doing this is what happens when your map gets too big 
for your interface, so where are you? And one of the things that I would suggest for that is using some sort of wayfinding device or a loop. So this is what we call a loop, basically, where you're putting something in your screen so that you know exactly where you are on the map. So this is the New York Botanical Gardens. And uh, what we did was, wherever you were in the gardens, it would actually just highlight. And this is another cool example because they're basically sketches. They, they're very comic book looking. And this is, some, is not some, a typical approach that you would think of for a map. People usually just go straight to satellite imagery or photographs. And we took a slightly different approach with that one. So let's see if I can run an example. So this is the Finnish interactive for Mount St. Helens. There we go, this is about 60 seconds long. This is the attract screen. So this is kind of the exposition to the story. This is what somebody sees before they actually jump into it. There's no sound okay, to it. Just checking. This is the interactive timeline. You're seeing all the revegetation coming back in. So if you see nothing else, you understand that life came back to Mount St. Helens. This is interesting because it's a very it's a 3D model, but it's very constrained. You can only see it from these three different perspectives. So in terms of budget, that's a much smarter choice than being able to see anything at any time. Notice that the map in the background never disappears. You can always get back to the map. That's what I like to call the buffet style of navigation rather than the menuing system. And I think that's a very smart way to do it because it's always easy to get back to where you just were. Once you get into any of these stories, you can look at a slideshow, you can watch movies, and it's all relative to the different zones in the background. So I want to talk about a few resources that people can openly access. And what I suggest for museums is leverage existing technologies. If you don't have to invent it, don't. So uh, two excellent sources for data would be the USPS. They have lots of what you call DEM uh, data systems, so digital elevation models. And then NASA has all sorts of data. And from my experience, they have been extremely forthcoming in providing either higher res images or different types of data or raw images. So reach out to them. Um, they're excellent to work with. I'm not going to touch on this too much, but the Google Maps API is also something that is very accessible, although there are different pricing systems. So sometimes you have to license it, sometimes you don't. Um, one of the challenges with it is that it always has to stream. So if you are not online, it does pose a challenge because you cannot license Google Maps data in a way that is just a video. It has to stream. Mapbox and TileMill, is anybody familiar with these, these programs? So if anybody's interested in cartography, I can't recommend Mapbox and TileMill tile highly enough. Mapbox is the WordPress of cartographic systems. And uh, I'm just getting into it. I'm hoping that my next talk will actually be about Mapbox. Um, but it is basically a publishing system TileMill is the application that you would use on your da desktop to actually be making the maps. Um, from what I have found, it is quite user friendly. It does use CSS, so you need to have a little bit of development school skills, but it's completely free. And it's very easy once you actually make the map to publish it online. And so it is uh, great across different platforms. We've used it for a couple different projects, including one that we recently did for Harvard and it works great um, on the web and on iPad. So it works cross browser, it works cross uh, platform. The last one just came across my desk. This is a balloon, a DIY balloon mapping kit. And uh, I think this is only, this is one of those things that can only come out of Portland. <laughs> 
So this is, um, I've seen like DIY cheese kits, DIY, DIY like craft beer things, but I've never seen a DIY balloon mapping kit. That's kind of amazing. It attaches to any point and shoot camera and whatever software you have, as it rises, it takes a whole bunch of images and then the software seamlessly puts it together. So what you have is a bird's eye view map of wherever you happen to be. I would love to try it and report back to you. <laughs> Some of you may remember this map. It is forever burned into my brain. <laughs> So I'm not going to talk about this too much, but I feel like when you think about maps, you have to think about gaming. Games these days are uh, essentially geo geospatial experiences, and what the gaming world can do is often exceeds what museums can do because making this sort of thing, of course this is an antiquated example, it requires a huge production team. But to me, I think it's really inspiring how immersive a game can be, and for me, it's one of those things that I kind of look up to and aspire to do. Um, maybe I'm not creating an entire world, but in a truncated experience that can be as immersive as gaming actually is. So I keep that as um, something to look to for the future. So I, I feel like as I've done this research and as I've looked at different uh, examples of what people are doing out there, we're really in a renaissance for map making. In the past, the tools have always been with a select few, but with some of these resources that I mentioned to you and all sorts of data, we're at a point where almost anybody with the right set of tools can make a map. And so that's really exciting to me. And what I would uh, encourage everybody to do is just go look at some of these resources, see what you can do, and think about your collections differently. Think about how an object could have a geographic-based story. So I wanted to leave you with that thought. That's it for my slides, but I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions or tell you more about what I do. If you're interested in maps, Second Story has done, uh, throughout their career, many, many, many different maps. So I'd look at their, I would look at their portfolio and check it out. Just a couple of minutes left, so questions. And please project so we can get it captured. Who wants to make a map? <laughs> yes. Um, I represent a public art collection which lends itself really obviously to mapping. Uh -huh. um, and there are existing um, maps, there are existing maps that are attempting to upload as much public art work as possible. <laughs> around the nation, um, or separately, maps that are um, dealing with heritage more broadly, or... And you're talking about archival maps, right? No. No. Okay. Interactive web-based okay. maps. And I don't really know how to evaluate um, the products. Like I don't, I'm not sure um, what are the kinds of questions to ask as I'm thinking about the Yeah, what type of different things are you looking at? I, I, I think it's case by case, but you're looking for a comprehensive solution? It could be with our, we have 4,500 objects located all over the state. So uh -huh. um, it's, I want something that's easily uploadable where I'm not managing a data set separately from my own database, that kind of thing that's more obvious. Yeah. But First things I would look at is who has access to publishing. So is it the type of software where you have to license it to multiple users? So I'd look at that budgetarily. And if you have to license it every time, that's really going to limit your flexibility with who's using it. So I'd look at something that is more global. What are some general considerations that you 
if you have more six points on a map, then you group them. Or when you go from one section to another, you change colors. What are some general yes. line parameters? Well, I think that's a really good question because if it's a flat map, then you can tweak it out, you can customize it, you can make it look beautiful. But if it's more of an interactive map where you're doing this sort of thing where you're zooming in and out and you have clustering, then you really have to accommodate for that sort of flexibility. You have to uh, accommodate that sort of responsiveness. So what we've done is you think about it in different planes. So when you're at this plane, it's a certain design. And when you're at this plane, it's a more specific design. So we would generate rules like, let's say there's five hotspots right here. We would say, if you're at this plane and you're at more than five spots, just turn it into a number rather than each individual hotspot. And as you move in closer, you work it out with your developer and you say, OK, once you're at plane three, show all five individual spots. But this is one of those. And that's why I keep pitching the, the paper prototyping, is that that allows you to really think about what happens at those different levels, rather than once, you're, once you've already developed it. You know. I'm afraid we are out of time, so I think I'm going to ask if you have additional questions that you come yeah. up and approach it with these guys individually. Um, uh, we have the exhibitor's uh, reception downstairs. Downstairs? Where are we? Downstairs. Um, so please come and hear a little bit about what MCN has been up to and check out the exhibitor's hall and have some refreshments. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening.